So it looks like it's time for a new project. I know that uh, we've been stuck in the 1920s and 30s for the last couple of months as I've explored uh, some of the early radio techniques that hams used to try to keep themselves on the air and in the band. But now I want to maybe come up a little bit further in history and uh, cover the novice years of the late 50s uh, through the mid 60s when uh, many of us were using shortwave receivers and entry level, we call them the four tubers, the five tubers. These receivers were being sold by all of the outlets, Lafayette and uh, Radio Shack and certainly uh, Heathkit are the big uh, suppliers of many of these receivers. And I featured many of those receivers in videos many, many times. Using a receiver like that for shortwave, like very strong international broadcast stations, no problem at all. The receivers can easily pick up shortwave stations around the world, especially at that time when the bands were covered with them. But trying to use a receiver like that on the air to make some of your first novice contacts, the first time you got on the air and dared to press the key and try to make contacts, that's another story. Those receivers were lacking. They were lacking in selectivity, they were lacking in sensitivity, and especially they were lacking in band spread. Very difficult to tune in a station and to get the BFO uh, on frequency so you could get the, uh, the code message through, so to speak. In the late 50s, we started to see some articles about building simple novice level receivers with your helper or your Elmer, as it's called. The Elmer is the person that works with the young ham radio operator to basically get them on the air, get them set up, get his antenna tuned, and give him a chance at least to make contacts. So your Elmer might have said, hey, rather than spending a hundred of your well-earned paperboy dollars or begging your parents for two years for a receiver that probably won't work very well to make contacts, why don't we build a receiver together? Hey, there's an idea. Let's build a receiver. And uh, a project that came out of that era was called the Simple X Super. Now that means it's going to be simple. The X means there's a crystal involved, and super means it's a super heterodyne receiver. A super heterodyne receiver, I can't build that. That's way too complicated. I'm having problems building a one tube regenerative receiver. How am I ever going to build a super heterodyne? Anyway, the, the article uh, came out in QST. We're going to investigate that first article and the Simple X Super Mark II. Those are going to be where we're going with this series of videos. We're going to build us a super heterodyne receiver. You're going to have to get some parts. As I hear tell, all the parts are crammed into one big part. Used. Yeah, then the one big part is cut up into little pieces parts. And parts is part. And I think I should go over what you probably can get easy and what are going to be more difficult to build this project. The first thing is you need a case. And they specified kind of an oversized case, in my opinion. You know, this 8 by uh, 12 <laughs> by 3 type case is pretty good size. And uh, this is going to run you probably $35 for a case like this. So right out of the box, you better be ready to spend some money to build the Simple X Super. Fortunately, the front panel is just a standard rack panel, you know, a standard 4U rack panel uh, made of aluminum will work fine. That's going to, of course, overhang this quite a bit. Why, why use a full-size rack panel to overhang? Well, the thinking was that this receiver would give you two bands, 80 and 40, with no real compromises. But if you wanted to get on 15, the other magic novice band, uh, that would leave you room to put a little converter over here, a little crystal controlled converter that would allow the receiver to also operate on 15, and of course today on 10 meters. And I'll show you an example of a converter like that that would work very well with this receiver. So first of all, the things that you can get your hands on. 
generally, you can get your hands on things like terminal strips, you know, different types of connectors. You can get the potentiometers that you're going to need for any project like this. You certainly are going to be able to get a hold of the switches and tube sockets, and capacitors, you know, the typical resistors. These are all easy to get parts. You know, dial lamps, and of course the tubes themselves. These are still fairly easy to find. Knobs, that kind of thing. Anyway, we're not really that concerned about the things we can get a hold of. These are all pretty standard parts. I'm not going to go crazy with parts that I know that you just have to purchase and, and get your hands on, or you have in your junk box anyway. So let's set those aside and assume you can get those pretty easily. The next thing we have to worry about is power. So you're going to need a small transformer. This transformer should have a 6 volt filament winding and it should be able to supply a couple hundred volts. So a transformer of this kind of size is what we're talking about. You can find these on old uh, amplifiers and radios from the 40s and 50s. They're pretty common. Or you can spring for a brand new Hammond transformer. They'll be perfect for the project. Uh, you're going to need an audio output transformer. It doesn't have to be very big. Any TV or radio of the 50s or 60s is going to have a transformer like this. The choke doesn't have to be oversized like this, but if you want to use a, uh, a choke that's uh, military style like this, you can. Uh, basically, we're looking for anything between, you know, two and five Henry's as the uh, power supply choke. And you have no problem getting electrolytic capacitors in case the choke is undersized. Uh, we can get 100 microfarad. 450 volt capacitors very, very easily today. So the tuning capacitor, up front they have a dual section tuning capacitor they call out. They need 140 picofarads in a dual section, something like this, or they make these smaller as well. It's just a receiver. But you can get away with, you know, dual section 365s for the main input tuning. Here's a smaller one that might be useful. This is probably just about perfect. And then a main tuning capacitor of some kind to do the, uh, the high frequency oscillator tuning. Again, I don't consider these hard to get parts. I consider these to be standard parts that you can find either at a ham fest, you can find possibly online auction sites, Look under the tables at the ham fest, you'll see parts like this. Or you can order new parts because, believe it or not, they're starting to manufacture a lot of this stuff again. And you're being able to get parts like this again. So let's take all of this off the table. And I want to talk about the reasons that you can not build the Simple X Super. You're going to be stopped. You can't build this receiver. Let's talk about that next. Okay, I've moved some of the parts off the table so we can uh, talk about why you cannot build the Simple X Super. And here's the box. Now, this would be the first one you'd think of. You can't build it because you don't have the cash. That's not really a legitimate reason why you can't build this receiver. Yes, this is a big deal if you don't have enough money to even buy the chassis, but I'm telling you, this is not one of the reasons that makes it impossible to build the receiver, at least in my mind. Um, here's number one. Now, this receiver uses a technique called image swapping. This is an image swapping receiver. You have one local oscillator that tunes in the 5 megahertz range, and we can look at the image of our 1.7 megahertz IF uh, by tuning the 80 meter band on one side and the 40 meter band on the other side. But just by flipping the input pre-selector, we're able to select 80 meters or 40 meters using the single 1.7 megahertz IF. So here's the first reason you can't build this receiver. Where are you going to get a 1.7 megahertz crystal that this receiver requires? The answer is you're not going to get one. And this alone is the reason you can't build this receiver. 
or can you? We're going to solve this problem quite easily with a $1 crystal. So stand by for that. So the first reason you can't build this receiver, we will defeat. We will be able to use a crystal filter IF and we'll do it successfully not using a 1.7 megahertz rock. The next reason you can't build the receiver are these things. They're mini ductor coils. It calls out for two of those. One is based on the front end uh, tuning uh, preselector, and uh, one is the local oscillator tuning. This is getting hard to find. We need to defeat this system and come up with a way to build the receiver not employing mini ductor. So that's reason number two you can't build the receiver that we're going to take care of. And that goes along with the IF cans and anything you need when it comes to coils. We're going to handle the coil situation so that you can build the receiver no matter what technology you want to use for the coils. Uh, another reason you can't build the receiver is the dial on the front. You need to come up with a 6 to 1 vernier. A specific vernier is uh, one like this Jackson vernier. But you could use any number of verniers on the front. This Jackson vernier is the one you want to try to get your hands on. Fortunately, these were produced in quantity. Uh, the Jackson brothers had the luck to produce an almost ideal part, and it was used in uh, transceivers throughout the hybrid era. So they built these by the thousands. You can find these. The Simple X Super is a band imaging receiver. What the heck is that? In a standard multiband super heterodyne, bands like 40 meters or 80 meters are tuned by first centering the antenna preselector to the band desired and tuning the local oscillator to the frequency that produces an IF or intermediate frequency. All of the gain, the high gain that is, is put into a single tuned IF and that's the basic superheterodyne method. You do all of the high gain in the intermediate frequency. And we want to tune 3.5 to 4 megahertz, the 80 meter RF band. We need a local oscillator that tunes from 5.5 to 6 megahertz. Basically 5.5 minus 3.5 equals 2 megahertz, our IF. We call this high side injection. High side injection, or putting the local oscillator above the tuning band, is very common with shortwave receivers. It's also used for AM broadcast receivers. Now if we change our band from 80 meters to 40 meters, we need to retune the front end preselector to 40 meters and change the local oscillator tuning higher to 9 to 9.5 megahertz. So when we increased our frequency or change bands upward, we had to increase the LO frequency to maintain the same LO high side injection to give us the 2 megahertz IF. This is how most single conversion multiband shortwave receivers work. Now I want to introduce you to a super heterodyne system that we call band imaging receivers. In the band imaging receiver method, the receiver will, of course, with that same 2 MHz IF, let's use that 2 MHz, respond to signals either 2 MHz higher or 2 MHz lower than the local oscillator tuning. The unwanted response, or image, is discriminated against by the tuning of the RF preselector up front. Normally, that image does not bother us if we have enough front end selectivity. Also, with our 2 MHz IF, in our example, we use the lower image for 80 meters. So we needed an LO this time of 5.5 to 6 megahertz in order to tune 3.5 to 4 megahertz. So what if we tried to use the higher image for 40 meters by using low side injection? The result is 7.5 to 8 megahertz. Well, we missed 40 meters, guys. We're a little bit high. We need to bring the oscillator range down by about 500 kilohertz. So now we know why they picked 1.7 megahertz and not 2 megahertz. 1.7 megahertz in the IF solves this issue. You end up with two bands. If you make the LO tuning 
say 5.2 to 5.7 megahertz, you get 3.5 to 4 megahertz with high side injection. So you're tuning the low image band. If you're doing low side injection or tuning the high image band, basically it's 6.9 to 7.4. So basically, we've gotten both bands and we're using the same LO tuning range. Now this is great, but it's very difficult to get 1.7 megahertz crystals to put in that IF crystal filter that the simple X super features. So I can't get that 1.7 megahertz rock. So let's go back to the 2 megahertz IF idea. Let's say we make the LO tuning 5.5 to 6 megahertz. This gives us 3.5 to 4 megahertz, 80 meters, high side, high side injection. But again, when we go low side injection, it's too high. It's 7.5 to 8 megahertz as our tuning range. But what if we modify the LO, uh, the 5.5 to 6 megahertz LO tuning uh, just for 40 meters? What if we modified that 5.5 to 6 megahertz local oscillator tuning just for the 40 meter case? How? By simply jerking the LO down in frequency when we're on 40 meters. The idea here is to center both bands on the dial. Using our slightly higher IF by changing the local oscillator range with a capacitor that we switch in just on 40 meters. Let's try it. It looks like we're exactly 500 kilohertz high on 40 meters. We need to change the local oscillator to 5 to 5.5 megahertz. This takes about 40 picofarads to accomplish. That's all. It's not bad. And we do get a benefit. By padding the local oscillator with that 40 picofarads, or something like 40 picofarads, it spreads the band out a little bit. Now, when we were tuning both bands in the original 1.7, You'll notice the whole band was covered on 80 meters, the full spread of the dial. But on 40 meters, it was compressed, kind of in the middle. By padding with the 40 picofarads, it's going to start to spread the 40 meter band out as well. That's a benefit. So that's all there is to it. The Simple X Super already uses this technique to tune WWV to 5 megahertz by similarly jerking the LO down with about 350 picofarad. So this technique is not new territory, and it's certainly not new to the Simple X Super. Using this higher IF technique, you know, an IF higher than 1.7 MHz, would also allow you to use uh, other common clock crystals you might even have in your junk box, like 1843.2 or 2048 kHz, very, very common crystals in the clock world. These could be used for your crystal filter in the Simple X Super. Using frequencies much lower than this, however, gets you into possible broadcast band bleed through. I know a lot of these image uh, swapping type receivers were uh, using uh, IFs around 1.5 megahertz, but they ended up with broadcast band interference. Also, you're going to learn that there are spurs associated with all super heterodyne designs. A receiver typically generates various undesired signals. These are called spurs. For example, the spurs might be harmonics of the local oscillator or various products and sums of their harmonics. This discussion about spurs and products goes way beyond what we need to know for the Simple X Super. But basically, this receiver scheme is very clean with only one in band spur susceptibility in each band. So this video is getting long and I'm going to have to cut it off. Basically, I just wanted to get you familiarized with the Simple X Super's super heterodyne architecture and to encourage you to start collecting parts if you're interested in building. This could be your first homebrew novice receiver, maybe your first super heterodyne. Yes, this circuit is 70 years old, but it will still perform very well on 40 and 80 meters on CW, sideband, digital, and AM. As always, I will post the diagrams and article PDFs on my Microwave One Radio Resources page on Facebook and, of course, on my Patreon page. Stand by for part two, where we get deep into the schematic and uh, start to understand the receiver and how it works.